Welcome back to Next Stage Podcast, everybody. We got Mr. Ethan James in the studio tonight. He's uh, returning. He's been here before. Uh, early episode. Actually, one of our first guests very early on. I think I was like your second guest, if not the first. No, yeah. Second. No. Second. I think That's it was second. It was, well, LJ was our first, actually. <clears throat> LJ was first. I was second. I had very long, very long hair. Yeah. Very homeless looking hair. I almost didn't recognize you. I was like, who is, who is this sexy stranger who's my, prowling my lawn right my now? It's my summer dude. Yeah, it's my summer dew, baby. I took a double take, and then there you were. So, uh, anyway, how you been, man? How's this whole crazy world cool period out, been uh, treating you? It's been crazy, man. It's been nuts. The world is a dumpster fire right now. That's the, my word of the month. Yeah, dumpster fire. I, it's it's soothing. <clears throat> it's really overwhelming, man. And uh, I just think that um, I've been doing the best that I can and uh, trying to stay focused on whatever positive that there is to stay focused on. I've also been a little caught up in the, in the, um, the social, so I just had the word a minute ago and now I, I forgot the word. Social goings on? The, the social. A better word uh, than goings on? Discord. Discord. Right. Discord or discourse? Discourse. Ooh. That's discord it. is discord. actually kind of what's yeah, going yeah, yeah, on. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of discord. <clears throat> but um, you know, I'm staying busy, man. I'm I'm chilling. I'm I'm just trying to stay active and healthy and happy. I have actually been like running a. Oh, well, started off as a crisis. Now it's more of a, a unfolding journey. But I had a personal crisis running concurrent to the national COVID crisis. Oh, wow. So I was like distracted by that sort of. Um, and what had happened was I actually, I'm going to give you the exclusive. We're going exclusive. We're going man. exclusive. A next stage exclusive. Here. I'm going public here on public. next stage podcast just because like I'm ready. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of, I've always been like an open book with my life anyway. Uh, I found that it helps other people more to just sort of be transparent about uh, your struggles and your journey and uh, you know you end up helping more people along the way that way and so it's always been something that really has helped me in my recovery and my mental health so back in October I I suffered a relapse oh wow I relapsed oh, uh, it was pretty intense it was or it was a pretty serious relapse I um, what happened the way that I processed it is uh, I had a uh, sort of an influx of really close friends pass away inside of like a real small amount of time. And uh, it was really difficult for me to sort of process that. And then at the same time, like simultaneously, I really think I had this sort of like real slow decline in my mental health, you know? And uh, it got to a point where I just, I didn't know how to handle it. And, uh, and I sort of freaked out and I went out and I relapsed and I ended up uh, using for like five, six months from October to mid February. Uh, and I just, I isolated. I uh, didn't really hang out with anybody. Didn't really talk to too many people. I, you know, fulfilled my bare minimum responsibilities. You know, I was getting work done i was getting shows played i was attending practices mm -hmm. but other than that i really wasn't doing much and like people who were close to me people like my roommates at the time uh the guys fiction um and and some close friends people who were close to me definitely knew that something was wrong yeah like something was off uh they had definitely noticed the change in my behavior and in my personality and I, I i wouldn't be surprised if a few of them uh even like specifically suspected that i had i had relapsed you know mm -hmm. and uh so about mid-february it all just sort of came to head and it, it sort of like ended in this cataclysmic event in which i was uh sort of s standing there figuratively speaking uh just you know at the center of my unearthed life that i had just spent six months like upending eight years of stable uh sobriety yeah. uh which was like a, a a tough thing to swallow you know what i mean 
uh, there's a lot of shame and guilt involved there. <clears throat> and, um, and, and I gave up and, you know, it, it came to head the, where my roommates actually ended up finding out, you know, they, they found some paraphernalia in my room and confronted me. And I, I immediately broke down and I was like, this is what happened. This is, you know, what I want. You know, I want to stop. I, I definitely need help. I get it. You know what I mean? Like, so there was no denial. No, absolutely not. I was like, there. Well, first of all, there was no denying it. Like they caught me red-handed. Yeah. They found a needle in my room. You know what I mean? So it, it, there was no denial. But I, I didn't want to deny. It. At that point, I was actually subconsciously like, I, I feel like begging to get caught. There was like so many times where I I wanted to end it. I wanted to come clean. I, I wanted to get out of it. But I had this significant fear of losing everything that I had built in those past eight years. I wasn't ready to take the chance of throwing all that away. So I sort of tried to balance this lie as long as I could um, because I had managed to build, to build a pretty sweet life inside of that clean time. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have an amazing band. I have great friends. I have great family. I have, I have these people in my life who've never known me as that person, that heroin addict person. And now they do and, and, and or they would if, if I if I came clean and I just felt like I didn't want to be exposed like that. Like you know popping I mean? the bubble. Yeah, oh, I was so ashamed, man. It, it, it really sucked. It was like I was living in my own personal like prison hell that I had built for myself. I, I couldn't reach out to anybody. I was really like suffering silently, man. It really, really sucked. And I'm really, really glad that my roommates went into my room when I had left because of, you know, because again, like I said, they, they were definitely like suspicious that something was going on. So they would like conduct room searches, which like, uh, you know, was fine with me. Yeah. Uh, I'm just glad that it happened. I went to detox the next day. I completely underestimated the seriousness of the situation, like immediately speaking. And I got out of detox after five days and I started using again a day later. And, um, and I used for another month and then exactly one month to the day when I went in on February, I went to detox on, in March, on March 19th. <clears throat> and uh, that time I built a plan and uh, I really wanted to go away and get some help. So this is right when COVID starts, right? Mm -hmm. So they're just shutting everything down. So all the, um, all the inpatient facilities that they would send you to from a detox are not taking anybody. So I have to, I, I had to go home, um, you know, I, uh, I, I got a different place to live. I had to go home. I had to sort of call these places every morning at 8.30 in the morning until I could find an open bed to the places that were still open. And after two and a half weeks, I got into a place up in Middletown that I went away to. And uh, I went away, I got some help. Um, I learned a lot. I processed a lot. I healed a lot which was the main thing that I needed to do yeah. was an exponential amount of healing and, uh, and forgiving myself. And I was able to do that. And I'm really, really thankful that like, I'm still alive here to sit at this table. I with am you too. Very much. And, and be able to talk about music and, and be able to talk about just another chapter in my recovery, because there was a while that I was like, man, I, I threw my recovery away. I threw my sobriety away. I yeah. threw eight years away. But like that eight years doesn't go anywhere. I still accumulated that eight years. I was able to stay clean and straight headed for those eight years. And yeah, I, I messed up for a few months and it was definitely like a relapse and it, it really sucked, but it definitely ended up being a, a for sure blessing in disguise situation because I really needed to press the reset button, you know, on my spirit and just like on my life. And uh, I ended up being able to do that. And now I'm just sort of rebuilding from that foundation, you know what I mean? Yeah, I've heard uh, a few people say about this whole pandemic and I guess COVID, you know, the, the experience in general and the virus itself is that it, it's exposing toxins in many ways between, you know, the, the, the you know, compromised people, unfortunately get hurt uh, the most by the virus itself, but then the economic kind of tenuous circumstances of businesses that were, right. you know, kind of, running on a thin budget or maybe not quite operating above board 
it kind of exposed a lot of that right. stuff. And and people in general having to stay home with just your own little square that you live in, as opposed to being out in the world, like in a weird way, it exposed a lot of toxins in society. And it sounds like you kind of had a parallel to that in your microcosm. I mean, I did, yeah, because I, I sort of had to, um, I feel like I was doing a lot of healing while a lot of other people were sort of coming apart. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in like a bad way because like, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on right now and it's easy to sort of get pulled every which way and feel really, really overwhelmed. We're, you know, we're dealing, we were dealing with a, a global pandemic. We're dealing with a historical revolution. You know, we're dealing with things that are just really shocking to the senses and the system, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, due to like the sort of forced isolation, after I had gotten, you know, I continued on with my treatment after rehab, I spent like 25 days in close quarters with a lot of other dudes with constant contact and constant connection. And then I got out and it was a culture shock to be alone for, I had to, you know, quarantine for 14 days and da da da. But yeah, it ended up being like the best thing ever, man. Cause I really did. I, it was the best time to want to get sober yeah. because there's nothing going on. No one's allowed to go anywhere. You have to sit there. You have to process. You have to do uncomfortable work. And it's all for the better. And like one of the things I was most terrified of, like I said, was like losing everything. And I, I ended up, I didn't, you know, I lost. Everything got put on hold. I, I didn't lose anything that I thought I would and lost things that I never thought that I would. Huh. And what do you it, mean? It, like I lost frames of thinking and ways that I used to deal with my emotions and um, sort of these unhealthy coping mechanisms and I gained new productive ones you know I lost like a couple of friendships that I really wouldn't think like oh that person would you know sort of be angry over it and, but I kept some people around that I didn't think would stay you know what huh. I mean and uh and uh, we had just, you know, the band and I had just hooked up with these really, really great people out in West Haven of uh, Horizon Music Group. This guy out there named uh, Vic Steffens, and he's a really important name in the Connecticut music scene. And we're making a record with him right now, and it's been such an incredible experience. <clears throat> and you know, our relationship with him is fairly new. And I was like, I was like, fuck, this guy's gonna be like, I don't want to work with this band if they've got an unstable lead singer. You know, I, I. I was petrified that I was going to be seen as an asset and not a liability or as a liability and not an asset. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, <clears throat> it wasn't that way, man. Everybody was everybody was sort of on board when they saw that I was really serious about getting the help and getting the healing time that I needed. I was like, yeah, let me go away. Let me get some time away and just you know what i mean i, I want to get i want to get healthy i want to be better I, I don't i don't want to do this anymore this is like it's almost like my brain was like you haven't self-sabotaged in a while let's mm. why don't we do that so it was something <clears throat> in you that wanted to cause some destruction at the time i, I mean i guess i don't know yeah. maybe who's to say yeah had you started <clears throat> the recording process before you or was it out of rehab that you started the recording process no no we, we started recording last year sometime but i, I mean i I was using through a lot of stuff and I was, you know, I was really sort of forthcoming about that too. When I got out of rehab, like I really started telling like w w the people that I told, I told, and I told them the truth about everything. And I was like, this is, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry for using like this time and this time. And you know, there were definitely times where I used at the studio there, like yeah. uh, this friend's apartment. I would be like, I'm really sorry. You know, I used in your bathroom, you know, cause I just need everybody. I wanted everybody to know like, how sincerely remorseful I was about the situation. And the members of my support system have just been nothing but loving and understanding, and they just want to see me do well. You know what I mean? And it's the same with the band. I thought I was gonna, I thought they were gonna kick me out of the band. I called, I remember I called Joao from uh, Detox, and I was, <laughs> I was crying. And I was like, I just don't want to get kicked out of the band. He's like, well, I mean, to be fair, you write the songs, bro. So <laughs> you, we can't, you can't, we can't, Fire, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we're getting a little uh, echo on the. Uh, and I was like, oh, you can kill that real quick. How relieving, and everything ended up working out, man. Yeah. It, and and that's why I really kind of felt comfortable coming and telling you the story. A, because you, I mean, I've known you for you're one of my oldest friends. I actually forgot that you didn't know. 
I had told Jesse. Yeah, I, had, I didn't know. A month or so back. Um, I will say that, like, when, when she told me, there were, there's something in me that I was like, I kind of wondered if something was up, you know? I, I was never seeing yeah, each other happens. as, like, regularly as sometimes in the past, you know, so I wasn't, like, around you enough, but there was something, like, I, feel I don't like, know why. Yeah. It was, like, one of those, like, where you catch, like, a whiff of something, you're like, do I smell? I feel like I'm somewhere. a person, that, not, not to, I'm not really great at talking, like, about myself like this, but yeah. I'm a person who has, I believe, very distinct qualities, yeah. both personality, physically, I just have, I got quirks, I got these, you know, very distinct qualities about me. And when one of those is off, when one of those doesn't match the usual Ethan James chart, yep. I feel like those who are close to me sort of raise an eyebrow. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I think that's valid because like, my my uh, sometimes can be hard to tell because you you have different modes right you know that's and i'm kind of used to that you have a wide range of expressions and versions of yourself that it's sort of like i don't want to say like chameleon like but sometimes it's like oh this is ej just in this way and you, right you never right. know because um you're someone who's been very open about your mental health struggles and things like that so it's sort of a thing you kind of give a person a pass like you know what maybe he just had a little right. bit of a tough day right doesn't feel like being social i understand you know, and it's when you get anxious you want to disconnect cool I that's know what honestly that's like. that was my number one go-to of denial when people were like you know something going on yeah you know, there was definitely like a couple of friends who were like are you are you using again and that would be my number one. I'd be like, you know, I'm not, I'm just really morbidly depressed. I'm just, yeah. I would use my depression as the excuse because that really was the lead in to the relapse. Uh, uh, I, you, you really, and you relapse way before you end up using the drug again. Yeah. Okay. You know, you, I think it was Halloween that I was having those feelings at, at the, um, uh, uh, Pol it was right around the beginning of October. Right yeah. The beginning, yeah. And it was kind of, there was something that, I, I don't know what it was, but I was like, yeah. okay, maybe he just doesn't want to be here right now or something. There was something. No, it was it was a crazy journey and it still yeah. is, but, and I don't want that to be, I don't want that to monopolize the whole interview, but. Yeah, I well, also, just got, you got to get I'm it off your chest. I'm also glad I got and, to tell you and yeah. sort of like get it off my chest and sort of like being able to process it again with a close friend in this environment it, yeah. it is definitely therapeutic, you know? And, and, uh, and I'm doing well, I'm well now. I'm focused and reinvested in my recovery. I'm going to meetings. I go to a program once a week on Zoom. You know, I am going to school to get a certification to become a um, a peer recovery coach so that, again, I can, uh, there's this saying I really, really love and it's, uh, I, we can only, I can only have, I can only, I can only give what I have. I can only keep what I have by giving it away. Mm. And uh, that really just, it hits me, man. It hits me. And I love to help people. I love to reach out to people with mental health and addiction issues. So um, keep your sobriety it, by giving sobriety to other people. Exactly. With the help that exactly. you can provide. I've been and there. That, here's how you deal that's with That's how it. it is, man. That's how I get by. It really, really significantly aids me in my recovery to aid other people in their recovery. So it just makes sense to do that. You know if you're I mean? doing that, do they do like testing on you to make sure you're still clean or is that like, off um, the I don't know. They... I don't really know. I think that would be uh, specific, what, different to whatever company I would end up working for. I yeah. don't really think so, but I mean, I don't really know. Yeah. I'm I was no just idea. curious if that's part of their sort of protocol to make sure. No idea. Yeah. But I, I'm really excited about it and it just makes the most sense for that to be the next step for me. Yeah. You know? So about the healing stuff, because you talked about like a lot of healing process that you're going through. Was music part of that stuff? Oh, 100%, dude. Oh my gosh. Just being able to come out to, first of all, I, I was able to come out of rehab to a record that we were already working on. Mm -hmm. So it took us a while to get back into the studio, but once we did, things sounded, it just, it, it felt really great. And so things were obviously slow when I got out because everything had closed down. So there was a sort of two, three month period of stagnant you know like the music scene shutting down and i know that I, I know my peers and you everybody in this room feels the same way but like yeah. the music scene shutting down was my worst nightmare come to life like i feel like i used to joke about stuff like that like oh, imagine a world where we couldn't play a show every weekend ah, that'll never happen yeah you know <laughs> huh. yeah what would we do without music what would i do if so i couldn't sing young, it? so stupid yeah and now it's like you, you some days you ask yourself if we're ever going to have like a local music scene again. And I, I believe that we will. I believe that we will be able to play music for people in person again at some point. Um, I don't know that it'll be the same. You know, maybe I don't know that. 
I, I think that we'll probably have to adapt to some changes. I don't really mind playing a couple of shows in a mask if I have to. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I just want a microphone. Yeah, sharing just, microphones. I, I wonder if we have to bring your own bring mic. Your own for, just bring yeah. your own for um, I miss it. You know, I miss playing shows, but we were able to work on this record, and I've been writing a lot of folk tunes uh, sort of for my own self, and I've also been doing like I've been doing a lot of like online requests for side money. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been like charging people like 50 bucks for three songs, and I'll learn the three songs for them. Everybody's been really happy about really? it. Really? How does that yeah. work? So it's, it's like... Like, you know, I, I kind of, I, I sort of like, made this huge database of covers that I and that I have yeah and uh, I just have them put I have them select three and if I don't know them I work them up if I know them I just record a video and I send them the videos and so is that kind of like the thing where people like me money. people have celebrities give birthday greetings and things like that where they like for a specific purpose oh you just... know what I don't know I that's a good question I wonder if anybody had used one of the videos for something else beyond their own liaison or and entertainment uh, yeah. preferences. But that's a good that's a good question. I hope I was given as a birthday gift to, <laughs> to someone. Do you know be... about that whole thing where people like yeah, oh, pay absolutely. a celebrity to say oh, whatever absolutely. you want? Absolutely. I'm a pretend celebrity at least. <laughs> I pretend that I'm famous. I, I walk around like I'm the mayor of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well you've got that spark of somebody who who you yeah. know carries himself in that way and the personality yeah. and all that. So that makes sense. But music's been uh, Obviously, as it always is, as you know, the the guiding light, the savior, you know, uh, in in music we trust. What does it do we, for you in terms of processing and healing? Like, cause, like the healing stuff you said about like undoing bad patterns of, of thought. Was it like you writing know, about it that helps so you? So it, it does. Like it, it's uh, for me, it's actually real simple. For when I play music, it reminds me that amongst all this rapid sort of unasked for change that is going on, whether we like it or not. Music is the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, not the way we play it, but the music itself is the same. The feelings that I get when I play music are the same. The, the good feelings that other people get when they listen to music is the same. So it's comforting to me that even though you can, de yeah, you can change the setting in which we create and perform the music, but you can't really change the healing factor of the music. The music is still there. You're not going to shut us up. We all just started playing music in our basements. You created a Facebook group that gained thousands of followers within like a week. Yeah. Dude, it was it was crazy. I loved that you did that. Quarantine Jams is an epic testament to what we as a music community will do together to save our own art and be able to continue to deliver it to other people. Because like we easily could have all just continued to write music in our basements without the cameras, and you know what I mean. But it ne but we have a responsibility to to give it to other people. That's why keep we're the here. community element alive. Yeah, we're I realize like of immediately that's what we were going to lose. Was I'm not going to see my friends right at open mic and the people who come out who don't even play but come out to support. And there was a whole um, culture, you know, around that. Um, aspect of music being part of the landscape right, right. that I realize I'm really sad that we're not going to have this for a little while. Like, let, let's figure out a way to Yo, try to and you preserve and some of it. You saved the day, I guess. <laughs> Something. It was amazing, dude. That, well, everybody uh, who participated group, did. Bro, that group, you know? I, and I, I'm not even being melodramatic, I guarantee you that group has saved lives. And I mean that, like, with my whole heart. Like, I guarantee you that that group is so powerful that there very well may be someone who was having just such a terrible day and just was not feeling living and maybe saw a song on Quarantine Jams or went into Quarantine Jams and just got a little music hug and just it and things turn. I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't have any problem saying that. If that happened, I, man, <laughs> I went, went beyond my goals for that. And that makes me so happy right, because right. that's all I ever would hope music would do for people. Because it did that for me. I when got I was my founding member badge. Yeah, man. On that bad boy. I got, like, I got four badges on Quarantine Jams. Founding member, conversation starter, and two others that I don't remember. But <laughs> count them. Four. How many badges do you got? You're the admin. You probably only got two. Four, baby. <laughs> Talking to Jesse. Mm. He's not on camera. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. 
<laughs> I love you, man. I love you too. It's so good to be back around you. And it's, I'm sorry I'm so to hear. I'm so happy getting that message from Jesse. Do you want to? Yes. Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> I absolutely want to. I mean, it, I'm sorry to hear that you went through what you went through and Thanks, that man. you had that, that relapse. I mean, that's, that, that's tough. And it's, I'm, I'm very, you know, impressed that you were able to come out and, and talk about this all because it's, you know, the only way to healing, you know, the only way to you know, come it's... through it. And, and I'm glad that music was a part of it because that speaks to the testament of why we need music in society. Yeah, why absolutely. we need it to stay around and you know, why it's important to preserve it. And why I need it. We, we need it. Yeah, we need it to live, man. And uh, yeah, yeah, man, it was rough, but it was just something that needed to happen. And, and I, I feel good feeling this way now. It's like, I remember what it was like when I first got clean and actually even further, when I first got off of methadone, like three years into being clean, I remember when I got off methadone and I was off everything, I had this like blissful feeling for so long. I mean, it kind of fades after a while. They call it the pink cloud, I believe. And uh, I remember how good I felt when I had gotten clean. And that, that's the sort of feeling I got when I, I came home from treatment. And uh, I sort of just got back to a fresh start on the ground floor. And I hadn't done too much destruction. I didn't burn any buildings down. I just sort of knocked them down to the foundation, yeah. but I still had a pretty solid foundation and I was still able to build upon that foundation. And that's what I'm doing now. And I'm like really happy about it, man. And I just have a whole new, I forgot what it was like to sort of be happy at the forefront instead of sort of faking it all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have a genuine smile on my face and I think that really sort of comes across and people know that and feel that and people know that i'm clean they, they know that i'm not just sort of feeding them words like they can see the sobriety in my eyes and my face you know yeah your mean? soul coming through yeah, again yeah kind of that stuff kind of kills your soul which i guess when it really does when your soul is hurting that's, and that's why you choose it yeah. i really just wanted the only thing that i knew that was going to numb me out yeah i didn't i didn't Stop want i didn't, want, I didn't do it because i was like oh i want to feel good I knew that I would for a little bit, but like I knew that I was in for a just suff suffering. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I sort of, I think maybe just wanted to suffer, but with opiates as opposed to without them. Mm -hmm. And then I, once I decided that I was better than the suffering was when I wanted happiness. And there's no way you can have happiness in an opiate addiction concurrently. So yeah. I had to choose one. Right. I'm <laughs> you glad you chose I mean? happiness. And I'd say the only drawback is I. Put a little, put a little, uh, I've tacked on mass, <laughs> tacked on a little mass since getting sober, but hey, you it's know, okay, man. It's better than looking like sickly skinny, you know what I mean? Yeah, so for sure. But uh, and now I get to do stuff like this with my buddies, you know, and I get to come out and hang out and I'll get to remember this, and yeah, it's awesome. It's great. Back into life, you know, yeah, yeah, it's been, I can't and I, I can't wait to play shows, man. It's yeah. been so long when fiction and I got back together, we, we hadn't been in a room together playing music for about two months because we, we didn't practice during the quarantine uh our our guitar player bat brad delivers liquor for a liquor store so he he had worked throughout that whole thing so he was sort of high risk really on on alert and he didn't want to be around people and it was only a few weeks ago when we got together for practice for the first time oh what was, was that like just so incredible it was first of all i was like we never took a break we were just so tight and we wrote a whole new song right there we wrote a whole song about the the social discourse going on right now uh and, and discord and discord <laughs> uh we actually went discord into, or dot cord Duh! we actually went into the studio today and laid it down and, really yeah yeah it's called felonious punk <laughs> it's and it's your yo it's an it's, it's a bare bones punk song uh and it's it's angry at what's going on right now and i think we're gonna have it out within the next few days Really? Uh, yeah. So you just burned it through real quick. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to get it out because it's relevant to the times and, and we think that it'll make people feel good. What was it know? inspired by? I mean, if this is coming out right now, I mean, let's talk about where that song came from. Like, did it just flow out of you when you were there? Just, like, did you it, write it before? No, no. Uh, it, I, had, I, I wrote it before going into the studio. I remember, I think I wrote it the day I got home from the Danbury rally. I went mm. to the Danbury rally when they, when they had it. And what was that like? It was intense. It was powerful. It was it was uh, it, it was anger. It, it was be beautiful, man. It was a beautiful thing to witness. Uh, there were uh, angry, oppressed people demanding change, and mm. there was a crap ton of people backing them up and supporting them. And the speakers really spoke with their whole hearts, and uh, they you know they uh, they were successfully got 
the mayor bowing out and spoke to him. They successfully, I think, got the, the police chief to come out and speak with them. And then a, a group went to 84 and a group went back to the library. But even the guy, even the people who went to, on 84 were peaceful. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Uh, and I remember returning home from that rally and just feeling it. And, and I was like, if I'm going to write a song about what's happening right now, it's going to be right now. And originally it started off as like a real fast folky punk song. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, it, it's basically just, it's about what's, what's going on right now. Uh, it, uh, you talk about a dream that I had about not being able to breathe. Uh, the second verse is about the police. Uh, the third verse is about the people and it's wrapped up in, you know, simple little power chords like Blink yeah. 182 sort of I think Green Day Dookie basically All right. oh, I like that man and I, I, I honestly I cannot wait to get it out for you guys like to, I can't wait for you guys to hear it well that stripped down arrangement before delivery. I leave here I'm gonna check my the band email to see if we got the rough cut from the studio we might get a little so sneak peek at it we won't put it on air but no, we can exactly, listen to it yeah, after we get exactly, off here exactly well yeah sometimes that stripped down bare bones because punk to me is the, is the core of rock I like, didn't even put any reverb on my guitar there though. you go you swear you be. swear to god I'm not even shitting you there's <laughs> no not one drop of reverb on that guitar on that dry song. hard and fast dry hard and fast dude <laughs> it's like four chords and it's, it's all you it's need great. four chords and the truth great. right four chords shout tracks <laughs> you know right. what I mean there's definitely gonna be a part that an audience is gonna be able to scream back at us I can't wait to get it out, bro. Now, is this? Do you think this is going to be a, a shift from what fiction does as music, or is this just a one-off thing? Absolutely not. No, no, no. Uh, well, uh, well, we already mix punk in with our stuff. Yeah, but, I was going to say. But there you mean politically? No, we're not going to write political songs ever again. I meant stylistically. Or <laughs> no, not, I mean yeah. I think political that it, songs are hard, man, because they can be dated and they can be preachy, and I, you know, for the most part, it's right. really hard to pull it off well. But I, I think this, this, is, this, okay, is, this just, is more than just political. This I think is, that this is just sticking with what we've been doing what we've continued to do is uh we call it genre hopping mm. we like we enjoy a genre hop man i want this record that we're putting out definitely has like punk on it reggae folk rock blues you know what i mean like that's it, always it, been the basis of fiction a little right, bit of everything i remember it, when i first always has been. heard your album it's like it's like a hayride around a tropical island with a few punk rock coconuts exactly yeah <laughs> and that's i love it and you know, sometimes I uh, sometimes I have concerns about the fact that like it, it, maybe it would become a problem in the future it, getting to a certain position or point in our musical career if we really can't like fit ourselves inside of a distinguished genre. But at the same time, I just it's not us. It's that doesn't not matter. And, and honestly, it's like. Not once the genre has been defined, if you're trying to fit into it, you're already like kind of losing because right. the people who defined it are going to always be yeah, better. Because you have parameters, first. right? Yeah, and then they're, they're, yeah, no. Everyone's going to want to go. Well, yeah, they're like this other band. If you're being compared, like they kind of sound like exactly. a good version, a different version of this band, but they're going to say oh, the real band was that first one, right? Exactly. And then you're just kind of like, a, even if you're a really, really, really good copy, you're still exactly. Not a copy. Not, so like this way, no one can ever say that we bit anybody's style. Yeah, you know what I mean. Fiction's always been its own thing. Everybody knows that. You know I think I mean? that's the future of rock and roll. If it's going to survive in any way, is to get more diverse. I think rock got 100%. got a little too stagnant, and where the ACDCs of the world were putting out the same album for right. thirty years, right. and you're like, hundred percent. I like ACDC, but like, come and, on, man, and, shift gears. And to me, it just makes sense. Be if you are an artist who has an eclectic music taste and have a broad sense of um, influence, then why wouldn't you write eclectic? taste of music and yeah. have a broad sense of genre and do something different than just this one. It never made sense to me. You know what I mean? I enjoy all those types of music, so why wouldn't I want to sing that? The only thing I can't do is like hardcore screamo. And believe me, I wish that I could. <laughs> if I could, <laughs> I would. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I dig on that stuff too, but if you think about it, man, considering how culture and stuff are changing, diversity is the flavor. Like, yeah. we've got to get more diverse in every way, so it's only natural that 100%. music should not be confined to one thing. It's I, like, let's, let's go in, into all things. I went through this um, phase. I want to say phase. I, I'll do it again. I just sort of like fell off doing it. But there was this like period of time between the ages of 24 and 27 that I was just obsessively looking for different local rap artists to work with and sort of be their white acon. And I want to be like, I want to sing on your hook. I want to sing on your hook. Let me, and I just wanted to collaborate with hip hop artists all the time. And it was great. I love doing stuff like that. I love putting folk and hip hop together. Yeah. You know what I mean? I like putting punk Old Town and, Road, man. Look at that. Yeah. Punk you know? and reggae together. Like, 
I just love it. I love, I love it. And then I love the people. I don't want to say who doubt. I don't feel like there are doubters uh, to say, but I want to say the people who sort of raise a brow to that and are like skeptical. I love turning them. Yeah. And then when they hear us, they're like, you do make it work. You mm -hmm. put it all together in a neat little snack. You know what I mean? For me to eat, and it was delicious. Yeah. And well, like, sometimes no. creativity needs some confines and walls to break down because if it was all open lanes and easy, where would the struggle be? Exactly. And then where would the interesting art and be? If all there's art no struggle, struggle, then you're going to sound like crap. Yeah, you're just going to be cruising. You got yacht rock. It's all <laughs> about the content. <laughs> if your content is crap, you're crap. We need t shirts. It's a full circle. <laughs> oh, that's a t shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always telling Joe out. Content, ABF, always be filming. Mm, there you go. These are the keys to success. <laughs> Don't forget it, my friend. Are you going to start like a multimedia uh, company as well? It, guide, you know? You guys want to work under my branch? You, yeah. you could become managers really quick. <laughs> which each referral you guys get a cool keychain. Does it all stack up to like a pyramid kind yeah. of shape? No, no, no. Yeah. It's an upside down diamond. Oh, it's not exactly. a pyramid skin. It's a, it's a, it's an upside diamond. down diamond. I want to be in the diamond club, then. <laughs> yeah, man. It's all good, dude. Life diamond is, content. Life is rad right now. Awesome, man. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that, and that you know that music is a through line in this all. And Life I wanted to, line, I wanted to ask you. You're talking about you know with um, what you went through, then also what the um, whole world has gone through with you know the, the lockdown. You're saying that that the music triumphing and the need for people to connect to music and what we do with the quarantine jams. Like, what is that about music that is so important to humanity? I here's what I believe, man. I believe that music is the one true universal uh, language. I it's agree. The, it is the one thing that every single human being, a part of that species on this planet, knows, can connect with, can enjoy, can share. And there's even even when you're fighting about music, you're still fighting over something that two people love. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's just like there is no there is no thing that music cannot connect with each with it yeah. do you know what i'm trying to say like, well yes it's, it's instantaneous and yes. it's permeable so if you have you know thousands it, it of is people perpetual thousands of people in one space they can't, can't all read the same book at the same speed right. but they can hear the same song all exactly the same exactly and it's just like hitting everyone at the exact there's, same time i i look at music as infinite there's never going to be a time where there's not going to be music for you to find that you've never heard mm -hmm. you're never going to hear all of the music no <laughs> <laughs> lord knows that i will try to hear all of the music but you probably don't even hear two percent of the music yeah. even if you stopped here and only went back yeah. you could never catch up I, to the reverse i like version. to liken music to the vast endless universe itself there it's just a it's never ending it is forever and i think that's really funky you know what i mean that's really rad to be a part of absolutely man the ever expanding consciousness yeah. of what's possible yeah. with, and there's only what's so trippy about it is there's only a few notes yeah you know yeah and you it's, only it's, got the the octave and the sharps in between it's like then now all of that that's created absolutely. from those and and that's notes. that's why it's been i think that's where the root of my struggle with the shutdown of the music community is my primary source of happiness and and uh of life has been taken away from me, you know? Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's been tough, but that's why I'm glad that I went through the relapse and the, and the recovery because with the things that I was able to learn emotionally in that helped me get through this, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. helped me be able to sort of bridge the gap and, and still thrive and feel useful and like I mean something despite the fact that I'm not on, I'm not on stage two three times a weekend entertaining crowds in New Haven or in Southern Connecticut or in Philly or in, you know what I mean like I can do things to advance my life and be a productive artist even though I can't perform live with my friends you know what I mean it'll happen again and I'll be overjoyed when it does and I think that's honestly going to be the 
the best show that we'll ever play of our career will be the first show back. <laughs> the reemergence. I, that's that's there's no there's no denying it. But for now, I I you know I got plenty of guitars at home. We got a record that we're finishing right now. We got a single that we're putting out in a few days. Uh, all is all is good on the music front. So this is you Thelonious. Know? Oh, sorry, Thelonious Punk. Single, but I wanted to say Thelonious this, Monk. Yes, of course, this but new Thelonious song is Punk. called Thelonious Punk. And the the record, which doesn't have a release date yet, is called Fire Away. Um, I'm hoping that the the timing and sort of the unfolding of everything and the reopening of the country times correctly so that we're still able to release this record in the summertime, have plenty of time to play behind it. I don't want to release a record if we can't play behind it. I just don't want to. And some of our peers have, and I think you know different folks different strokes yeah and i i think that their records are doing just fine and i think that's great but us personally we don't want to play a record that we can't play live shows behind would like, you hold it back if you weren't able I, to I, and, that, and that's what i it's like that's there's no definite like yeah i think that we would it, it's difficult it's a very conflicting decision you won't know until make. it's done like i do don't want to have to do we hold this i don't want to have to hold the record until next year yeah uh if we did we would obviously come up with some like alternative plan so that we didn't become irrelevant and we were to do something over that year but i really would love for it to not come to that and so i'm trying to just think optimistically i'm trying to uh borrow from joao's endless tank of optimism yeah that everything's just going to work out and it's going to be fine and we'll still have August, September, and October to to maybe tour the record and, and da da da. Uh, that's that's the perfect world scenario. But if mm -hmm. it doesn't work out like that, it's cool. We'll roll with it. Everything's gonna be cool. Fiction's not going anywhere anytime soon. But so, what are your thoughts about how the world in general, maybe just the country in general, is going to uh, music is going to take back off after this? Like, what what do you think is going to happen with the future of music from this point on? Because this is a very cataclysmic change we right, all went through, right. a defining yeah. period in many ways. But like, what's how is it going to come out of it? You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I literally have no idea. I've read so many articles, and I, I stopped reading them at a certain point because they all just gave me really bad anxiety when I think of like the music scene changing into this sort of post-apocalyptic wasteland, you know, of mm. bands that used to be and venues that were, but not, a, you know, when the acoustic Ghosts. closed, I, I in Bridgeport, the acoustic closed down, and I'm just over here like begging someone buys it or some like magical angel investor comes down from the heavens and purchases the Connecticut music scene and yeah. saves it. I don't have any idea what to expect and that's what makes me so anxious. But again, I'm trying to keep it cool and, and think positively, but I just don't know. I, I don't know. I want well, maybe to, like with know. a wildfire, new growth will come out of it that we didn't expect. And I'm sure that it will. I'm you sure know? that it will. And, and that's, you, you bring up a good point. There's probably like, some dead wood that could There's have been taken out. probably results that are going to come of it that we don't even know, we don't even think of right now. You're right, and and I, I don't know, and I'm hoping that it just works out. I, I know that artists as the music makers and people as the music takers will not allow the music scene to die, local yeah. or national. There's just kind of like this not gonna happen. plastic membrane between them for now where they both want to get through yeah, yeah. to each side. It's like, how happen. are we going to get through this thing, literally through exactly. this barrier, and what's it going to be like? And it's like, yeah. that, but again, music brings everyone together. So you have a, 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 if you have a large enough group of people thinking of how to resolve something and then how to move forward, we're going to do it. It's going to happen. We'll play music yeah. for people again. People will be inside of a venue again. You know, will you have to wear a cloth covering over your mouth? Maybe. Is that the end of the world? It's not. Do you no, think man. it is? You need to reevaluate. I'll wear a life. bandana every show to go to if I need to. Oh, like, that shit. looks cool. It looks cool. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You need to get some but crazy whatever. ones. We'll put, you know, we'll buy mics. It's a Mad Max, we'll like mics leather ones with studs to, on yeah. them. <laughs> They'll start selling condenser mics like, we'll sound crystal clear yeah. with mask on. Maybe yeah. it'll be built into the mask. Yes. You know, like the oh. gas mask style, the mic built Genius. in. <laughs> Who knows where we go from now, Mo, but we'll, you know, yeah, we're going to keep so. playing music for as long as that there's people listening to it. No. Yeah, and that's what I kind of, with, with the things that are going on, the protests, they are a huge testament that the human spirit can make change. And so Absolutely. no matter what we're seeing it in that arena, but I think that's just as much likely in the music arena too, that like humans, if they want something bad enough, they'll make it happen. Yeah. And we, I'm so glad for that happening because we're seeing that we still have power yeah. and more power than we think we do. Yeah, whether, and, it, whether it's continuing a music scene or like, you know, fighting for equal rights and yeah. uh, ending systemic racism. It's all human People power. People want something, they're gonna get it. Exactly. You know, especially if they believe they deserve it.
You yeah, know man. I mean? And everyone deserves music, just mm-hmm. like everyone deserves fundamental human rights. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> Dude. Everyone deserves not to die. <laughs> That's probably the best way we could end this thing. I don't think there's yeah. anywhere to go Until from there. the universe deems itself. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to chime out? I would love to oh, chime man, out. Oh, man, that would be amazing. Good seeing you again. Love y'all. Bye. That was a good chime. <laughs>